Hey there once again YouTube. I know it's been a while, but don't you worry, I am still around. And if you think that I haven't put up a video for a while, just go and check my website on the many pages on my website because I might have done a post without doing a video about it. So remember to always check my website every day or two, see if something new is up. Um, right now I just want to let you know on October 3rd, 2018 I put up my post finally about the intense swarming at Long Valley Caldera from September 13th through September 30th. Remember this round of swarming was pretty intense, magnitudes weren't large at all, but it was pretty intense guys. It was a very rapid fire swarming that was occurring on multiple days and I do show a lot of data pertaining, well not a lot, but a good amount of data pertaining to some of these earthquake swarms on this post and I'll leave a link to that in the description box below and next we're gonna oh by the way also let's go to the more drop down menu to monthly volcano updates this was a little late but I did get out my monthly volcano update for September 2019 and the volcanoes of interest for September 2018 were Long Valley Caldera and Mount Shasta so and I will talk about this at the end of this video so if you want to see this just stay tuned also, early yesterday on October 9th, 2019, we saw a magnitude 2.0 at negative 0.9 kilometers in depth strike right under Mount Rainier, stratovolcano in Washington State. Now, nobody reported feeling it, and it isn't too crazy, but we haven't seen a magnitude 2.0 around Mount Rainier. This is the 2.0 around the West Rainier seismic zone, which I don't really focus on much because when earthquakes occur over here, they mainly are caused by tectonic activity, mainly. But the ones to watch out for are the ones underneath Mount Rainier, and of course some along here could be related to volcanic activity as well. But I'm more focused on underneath the volcano itself. So the most recent 2.0 actually under the volcano or somewhat near the volcano was in 2017 on July 29th. The most recent one actually under Mount Rainier itself for magnitude 2.0 and above would be... On February 24, 2016, we saw 2.3 and 0.2 kilometers in depth right under the stratovolcano itself. So it doesn't happen too often, guys. But again, it's just a 2.0. It's part of normal background seismicity. There is no intense swarming at all yet. Uh, you never know when that may happen, though. So always keep an eye out for it. Let's take a look at this in the seismic program swarm just real fast. It struck at 1124 UTC on October 9, 2019. And also, this map is showing magnitude 2.0 and above earthquakes, and there have been 40 since January 1st, 2010. Here you are in the seismic program swarm with data from RCM and the UW network broadband vertical with a 1 hertz high pass filter. Notice we see at about 1124.40 UTC or so, we do see the magnitude 2.0 earthquake, which struck right under Mount Rainier itself. Kind of a strange looking earthquake, that is for sure. But we did see a 2.0, and then right afterwards we did see an aftershock of somewhere near the same range. I did not see this one reported as of yet. I'm going to say, though, it's probably half the size, so maybe a 1.0 to 1.3, possibly. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Some weird other seismic activity, but a lot of this could be related to uh, glacier movement on Mount Rainier, because gla uh, the glaciers on Mount Rainier are so large, and they move all the time. I even heard some crack, too, so... Some weird stuff does go on at Mount Rainier, that is for sure. But as for the two earthquakes that were reported, actually this one was reported, the 2.4, and this one has yet to be reported. So that's pretty much it for right now for Mount Rainier. Let's check out something else. Also, as of the past few hours, we did see a magnitude 3.9 at 5 kilometers in depth, supposedly in Arizona, and at 3.5. Again, supposedly at 5 kilometers in depth in Arizona as well, in the same location. Very strange seismic activity. I rarely see any seismic activity, if any at all, down here in this location right here. But why don't we go take a look at this in the seismic program swarm for the closest seismic station. And by the way, this is right across the American border. I mean, this is in Mexico right here, but the American border is right there. So it is in Mexico, but just barely, just barely. And also, nobody has reported feeling this magnitude 3.9, which struck at 110 UTC today, just a little bit ago, which would be about 610, actually, wait a second, 5, 6, yeah, that'd be about 610 p.m. Pacific time. Excuse me, sorry, I was trying to do the math in my head. <laughs> so about 610 p.m. Pacific time. And the closest station, sadly, is DUN6 in the AE network which was about, took about 25 seconds to reach that station, so it is pretty far away from the epicenter. We have no closer stations, but we will see what shows up on this station right here. 
Here we have DUN6 in the AE network broadband vertical, and I have added a 1 hertz high pass filter to get rid of those pesky background microseisms. Now we do not see the event yet, but it is right around the corner. Let's scroll down just real fast. Go all the way down here. Okay, so right here we do see the magnitude 3.9, which struck in Mexico, but right along the border of Arizona and Mexico. Very peculiar looking earthquake right here. I mean, very, very strange, but it was quite a distance away from this station, so we should see a clear, clear separation of P and S wave arrivals, and that is what we see right here. But there does kind of seem to be a strange third increase in energy right here, which could be an aftershock. That actually could be a very quick aftershock occurring basically right after the earthquake occurred, maybe a 2.0, 2.5 or so. And going forward, we really don't see too much at all since 3.9 and possible 2.5. And then right here, we do see the magnitude 3.5, which struck. So very, very intriguing, guys. And we see the clear P and S wave arrivals taking a little while to arrive on this seismic station in Arizona. So what do you think is going on down there just across the border, guys? What do you think is going on? Strange location for these earthquakes. And before I start with a few other things, we're going to look at Steamboat Geyser on my page, this 2018 Steamboat, Steamboat Geyser page, excuse me, under Yellowstone drop-down menu under Steamboat Geyser Eruptions. Now, this page will be helpful, and I did update it with the most recent eruption, which is the 39th eruption of 2019, which is shown right here, which is the 71st eruption since it reactivated in early 2018. Can you guys imagine it's erupted 71 times? I mean, of course, there have been many, many, many minor eruptions that cannot be t uh, detected on the seismic stations, but for the main, major, run-of-the-mill eruptions, there have been 71 since it reactivated in early 2018. Now, this eruption here had a much stronger amplitude than the previous one. Interestingly, though, according to the stream gauge within the outflow channel of Steamboat, that this eruption ejected less water than the previous eruption, but it had a stronger amplitude. Huh? I think that was pretty strange. Steamboat continues to set a new record every time it erupts since it broke the all-time record on August 27, 2019. Again, this is the 39th eruption of 2019, which struck at 8.45 p.m. Mountain Time, October 8, 2019. And we do see on the web recorder, YNM, right here, there's a steamboat eruption right there. Very strong amplitude from this eruption, but it ejected less water than this eruption. So, very, very strange, guys. Here you have volcanoes.usgs.gov at Yellowstone National Park and Caldera, like I like to call it. And up here at Norris, we see many temperature gauges, but the one we like to focus on is Steamboat Geyser right here. Now, the past seven days, we did see those precursors of minor eruptions increasing the temperature uh, so that the daily up and down is not being able to be seen. And then all of a sudden, boom, we saw the eruption right there, and it started to calm down and go back to normal background levels. But here we are right here. Notice the precursors and then boom, eruption, precursors, eruption, precursors, eruption. So again, you can't really predict when Steamboat is going to erupt. Sometimes the precursors last only two days. Sometimes they can last as long as four to five days. So it, there's really no way to tell. But, but really, Steamboat Geyser is not going to erupt until you start to see these minor eruptions starting to occur. And you can see that happens every single eruption. Every single eruption, guys. So just keep an eye out for those precursors. And once you start to see that happen, then usually that means Steamboat is just right around the corner, guys, within just a few days. So, But it shouldn't erupt for another, what? Shouldn't erupt for another, I'm going to say, six, seven days? I think it will erupt on October 16th, personally, but I don't know yet. So we should be seeing precursors increase in the next three days. So just keep an eye out for that. Here we are at isthisthingon.org with the Webby Quarter for YMC near Maple Creek. Now we do see some very teeny tiny quakes throughout the day, but we do see some a little bit larger quakes, probably around the 2.0, 2.5 range. Actually, these are nowhere near Maple Creek. These were striking down near Pitchstone Plateau. And as you will see right here, just like we should see with Magnitude 2s and everything, it does show on multiple stations across the park, which is what you should see, guys. If you think a swarm is occurring and only shows on one station, it likely is not occurring. So right down near YPP, thank God they got YPP and YMS back up and running so we could see the swarms that occurred down near this location, which they do pop off every now and then. But let me go back to what I was going to talk about. Let's go to the calendar, which is the archive for this seismic station. Now let's pan over just a little bit, right about here. So 
On September 26, 2018, we did see some swarming increase from the Maple Creek area. Very tiny quakes. Not even that many. Maybe about 10 maximum for that day. And let's see. Was this another day that had some swarming? Uh, possibly. Though that's kind of strange. That could be some swarming. Haven't looked at that quite closely. But let's go over to the 4th. On October 4th, we definitely did see some swarming and seismicity increased near the Maple Creek area. But I think the largest magnitude was 2.0 or so. It wasn't too, too crazy. On the 5th, swarming did continue. and kind of calmed down around the 6th, pretty much. And then on also October 9th, we did see some a little bit of an increase in seismicity near Maple Creek. This is nowhere near an actual Yellowstone earthquake swarm. But we definitely did see some swarming over the past uh, three weeks, two weeks to three weeks. So it definitely could be picking back up again like it should. And today we're going to talk about Pitchstone Plateau in just a second. But at YML, let's go all the way to YML. Let's see here. See, I, I kind of like these archives, guys. I don't use this too much because I like to download my data straight through Iris and open it up on Swarm. But these archives are definitely helpful when trying to pick out random events from a long time ago. Now, on October 6, 2019, we did see a quick, very, very quick rapid fire swarm near YML, possibly near the Lower Geyser Basin, which is a little bit closer to YML. I'm going to say here, let's try to go to Yellow. Nope, that's Mount Rainier. Nope, that's Wyoming. Let's go over. And so just real quick, over here near Madison River is where the other swarming was taking place that I was showing you on station YMC. But I believe the swarming that occurred at YML actually on the 7th notice it says 10-7 right there for the UTC date. And about what? We're going to take a look at this in swarm in just a second. I'll get the exact times in just a second. But around 4 to 5 UTC. We do see the only reported earthquake for that time period for Yellowstone on the 7th, 409 15 UTC was at 1.9 and 3.9 kilometers in depth right over here just north northeast of West Thumb Lake so let's take a look at it in the seismic program swarm from seismic station YML which supposedly was the closest station to this swarm supposedly let's take a quick look at this earthquake just to see the origin real fast go to phases Okay, so it's saying borehole 208 was the closest. Let's download both 208 and YML real quick. Okay, so here we are in the seismic program swarm. Let me zoom in real quick. Okay, so we do see, let's, let's see. Okay, so this is the swarm right here from borehole 208, which supposedly was the closest seismic station to this earthquake swarm. So they probably did get the location of this event correctly. One, two, three, four, five, six. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. No more than really 19 earthquakes at all. Really no more than that at all. And probably the largest was this one right here. I believe 1.9. So it was a very, very short and very, very small swarm. Less than 10 minutes long. I mean, what is that? Let's see. 407 UTC to about 413. That's about 6, 7 minutes long. Very, very short swarm. Very short, but a swarm nonetheless. And so let's go to this one right here. Let's add it to the clipboard real quick. There's that. Okay, and now let's make sure it's attached. Let's attach it. There we go. Let's go to YML right here. Okay, let's zoom in a little bit to the largest event right here. Zoom in one more time. I want to get a good close eye on the P wave. And let's put it to the clipboard so looks can be deceiving although it looked stronger on station yml and you can see there is a higher amplitude count on station yml you can definitely tell that borehole 208 saw these events arrive first so it looks stronger on yml but borehole 208 was the closest station isn't that interesting so you can't really use the strength of any given event to really tell where it occurred or what station was the closest, you got to look at the P wave arrivals. And Swarm can help you do that with the wave clipboard. So we saw that Swarm. Let's move on. Here we are at isthisthingon.org slash Yellowstone. Now, first again, I was going to talk about this at YPP, the Swarm that just broke out a little bit ago. But I want to go back just real quick because I wanted to show you this. You might notice the seismic signature. I'm going to say around doo -doo 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 -doo, around 2002 UTC or so. And notice how it does show up on many of the seismic stations around the park. You do see it again right there. You can even see the PNS wave arrival with the Webby quarter, which usually doesn't happen. 
And you can see it showed strongest on YPK, showing it occurred either in, within the eastern section of Yellowstone or farther east, maybe northeast, southeast. But you can tell, here it is, right here. And that is, my friends, a mine blast. Now, may not believe me, and I may be wrong, but I have seen mine blasts come from northeastern Wyoming. Here we go, right here. From northeastern Wyoming near Gillette, actually, and a little bit up near Montana, we do see mining explosions quite regularly, actually. Here I have the largest magnitude first, but the most recent reported one, and it does take them a few days to report mining explosions in this location right here, and you can tell Yellowstone is right over here. Now, you may be asking yourself, that why why is it traveling so far, so quick? And by the way, the last one reported was on July 19th. So that was quite a quite a ways away ago, guys. So hopefully they get around to reporting the most recent ones if they are mining blasts. I'm not saying they are, but they look somewhat indicative of them. But the thing is, these although they say they're around the surface and mining explosions somewhat occur underground, they must be occurring very deep, guys. And they've been doing this for years in this location. So there's got to be like an underground cavern or underground city in this location. There has to be. I mean... I believe the largest I saw ever was a 4.0. Do you know how large of an explosion you need to reach a 4.0 earthquake on the Richter scale? That's a lot of energy. I mean, I think one of the nuclear tests in North Korea many, many, many years ago was a 4.2. Register as a 4.2. Then, of course, the most recent was a 6.3 nuclear test. But I'm not talking about that one. But still, I mean, you need some very, very strong explosives, large explosions to create anything around 3.0 to 4.0 earthquake guys i mean it's pretty pretty crazy but let's go to the largest magnitude first and see if this really is the case magnitude 3.7 on july 4 2019 okay so let's go up here let's go to the fourth go to july click generate report so let's see if we can see something similar okay where is july 4th oh ypk is offline on this day okay well that's not very helpful at all okay let's see if we can find it on one of these stations you know what why don't we pick a different one because apparently it was not working well that day someone one that's the same size is on 517 so let's go to come on buddy let's go to 517 Okay, on 517 at what was the date? Or excuse me, what was the time? 2003 UTC. So about 2003 UTC. 2003 would be this right here. This right here, I believe, was an Oklahoma earthquake. But this right here is the mining explosion, a 3.7 mining explosion. You can see it does appear on many seismic stations at Yellowstone. Just giving you a quick overview. And there it is right there. And of course, YPK is not showing it because it was offline for quite some time. It would show it if it were there, but YPK didn't get back online for quite a while afterwards. So let's go to right now. And we do see YPK over here. Yep, we do see that event. So why don't we go to the GMAP, which is my favorite tool in the world. Go to IURSSD. Notice Black Hills, South Dakota. Notice Rapid City. Notice Gillette is right in this location right here. Notice we do have... If I pan over enough, Yellowstone National Park right there. So th this is the northeastern corner of Wyoming. A lot of these explosions are occurring somewhat in the northeastern corner of Wyoming. So the closest seismic station would be RSSD. So let's go see right over here. Let's go to IU, RSSD, 00BHC. I already have the codes memorized in my head because I download data from there a lot. All right, just to top it off, we'll do the 13th, even though it's not the 13th yet. Data is downloading. So here we are in the seismic program swarm. I have RSSD opened, and I have YPK opened as well. Remember, YPK is the easternmost station at Yellowstone, which saw the station arrive first out of all the stations at Yellowstone. First, let's go to Y, excuse me, RSSD. And let's do a 1 hertz high-pass filter just to get rid of some of the lower frequencies just real quick. Because I just want to see the event itself right here. 10 hertz is the maximum frequency range on the spectrogram for this station. The station does not record anything above 10 hertz. It is an older station, I believe. Poor old guy. But we see the event right here. Why don't we add it to the clipboard real quick. 
Now let's go to YPK. Let's go right here and add it to the clipboard. Make sure it's centered on there. Let's see if we can zoom out real quick. And let's add that to the clipboard. Okay. So right here, excuse me, right here, you see our SSD is on the top, which is in pretty much near the northeastern section of Wyoming, and YPK at the bottom. Notice how the P-Wave arrival of this event occurred far closer to our SSD than YPK, even though YPK seemed like it was coming from Yellowstone. It made it seem like that, but look at that. Our SSD saw it occur much closer than YPK, so this could be another mining explosion. But then again, I, I am questioning a lot of these ones being mining explosions because it's just weird. Some very strong explosions occurring a lot, especially during the summer of this year and last year. It was just off the charts. So I have no idea what they're making down there. I mean, they must be mining a whole slew of mining deposits because they're pretty much nuking that whole area down there with little teeny tiny nukes. So that's very interesting. Let's move on to the swarm that occurred today. Here we are back at isthisthingon.org. Just for a quick overview, we did see a swarm broke out just a little bit ago, a few hours ago, and it does look like YPP is the closest seismic station because it actually is showing more microquakes than any other station in the area. So I'm just going to use this station to take a look at the earthquake swarm. Not too many earthquakes, but again, I don't know where it occurred. I'm thinking probably, I'm going to just venture a guess, and you could tell they have not reported anything yet. They probably will tomorrow or the next day. But just saying, it's probably going to be somewhere in this is this area near Shoshone Lake and Lewis Lake, which has seen some interesting swarms in the past that I have documented on my website. Again, always check my website for things. If you don't know where to find them, just check my website. Got a good amount of stuff on there, my friend. Okay, so we're going to take data from YPP just real quick. Let's go to YPP, 01EHC. There we go. And data is downloading. Here we have YPP in the seismic program swarm. I'm going to scroll all the way down and we did see some swarming. Probably the largest being a magnitude 2. Probably I'm going to venture out there and say it's a magnitude 2. Some mid-range frequencies, but for some reason a lot of these stations at Yellowstone do not... Although, they, although the stations do record frequencies up to 25 hertz, they're very weak. They do not record very well at very high frequencies unless they're a broadband station. A lot of the short period stations I notice are better recording frequencies below 15 hertz, which I find very strange. I don't know why that would be, but who knows, guys, who knows. But we do see some mid-range mid frequencies on these events. Right here, I'm going to venture a guess, say maybe magnitude 1.3 or so right there. And there's another aftershock right after there. Largest would be this one right over here. Right there. Probably meant to do 2.0 to 2.2, I'm going to say. Scrolling forward, we see a few more events. Very, very small. Kind of like a rapid fire swarm. Kind of. Could be associated to fluid flow. I'm not too sure, though. Just showing you the swarm. Not seeing too much, not seeing too much. There's another little tiny quake right there. Another one right there. Another one right there. Oh, and then we saw a bigger three of them, actually, in rapid succession right here. This one I'm going to say maybe a 1.8, maybe 1.7. Not too sure, though. I'm just venturing a guess. And we saw a few more teeny tiny quakes after that, and that's pretty much it. And a tiny quake down here. The most recent data, though, as of 7.51 p.m. Pacific time, October 10th, 2018, is basically nothing at all. So we'll just have to keep an eye on it. It's possible a bigger swarm could break out in the next 24 to 48 hours. Just putting that out there just in case if it does, but it probably won't. So just keep an eye on that, guys. Let's move on. Here we are at spaceweather.com viewing the page for October 9th, 2019. Monday night football volcanic sunset. On Monday night, October 7th, more than 50,000 football fans in Levi Stadium watched San Francisco 49ers thump the Cleveland Browns 31 to 3. Woo, man. Fortunately, one of them looked up at the sky and said the sunset was full of volcanic colors, says Dave Wixelman, who took this picture from the upper deck. Let's take a look at the picture just real quick. Notice the purple haze, guys. Notice it's very, very, very purpley. Let's go all the way back. Fortunately, we were facing west and had a great view of the sunset. I took the picture using my smartphone, and this is how it looked straight out of the camera. Very purple. He witnessed a Rokoki sunset. Please tell me if I'm saying that right. Rikoki. Rokoke? Rikoke. 
Yeah, the Russian volcanoes are almost just as hard as the Icelandic volcanoes to say. On June 22nd, the Rikoki volcano in Russia's Kuril Islands erupted with such power that tons of sulfurous, sulfurous excuse me, gas reached the stratosphere. That gas has been swirling around the northern hemisphere ever since. Fine volcanic aerosols in the stratosphere scatter blue light, which, when mixed with the ordinary sunrise red, produces a purple hue. Purple, however, isn't the only thing to look for. Volcanic skies are also marked by a yellow twilight arc with long, diffuse rays and shadows. As Wixelman's photo shows, many of these features are visible even through the bright lights of an NFL game. That's pretty cool, guys. And the Rikoki eruption... The Rikoki eruption occurred on June 22nd, 2019 at about 4 a.m. their time, guys. Yeah, and it was in the Kuril Islands in Russia. Very, very large, very explosive eruption, guys. It, I do not know the VEI associated with it, but here, it, this is from the International Space Station, guys. This picture is literally from the International Space Station. Look at that. That's from space, guys. Look at how high that plume is. My god, that that was a very, very large volcanic eruption on the Kuril Islands. Very intriguing, guys. Let's see if we can read more about it. If they tell us the VEI eruption must have been, I'm going to say probably VEI-5. Probably very close to VEI-5. Let's see. Do, 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 do. The Rokoki volcano bear, uh, rarely erupts. The small oval-shaped island most recently exploded in 1924 and in 1778. The dormant period ended around 4 a.m. local time on June 22nd when a vast plume of ash and volcanic gas just shot up from its 700 meter wide crater. Let's see, is there a VEI associated with this? Oh, here's another image of the volcanic eruption right there. Let's see here. I don't see a VEI at all, guys. Here's another one from space. Yeah, that's pretty large. Pretty large, guys. Do, 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 do. Yeah, I'm not seeing a VEI, but it was a large eruption and created purple sunsets and sunrises all around the world, so I thought that was pretty cool to share. Something I almost forgot to talk about real quick is Hawaii. Now, seismicity continues within the mantle plume conduit pretty deep, guys, from about 20 kilometers to 40, maybe even 50 kilometers in depth underneath Pahala, Hawaii. Now, uh, the inflation, which is the uplift, the swelling of the ground because of magma supply to each and every chamber, is occurring at the Mauna Loa Summit, the Kilauea Summit, and the Kilauea East Rift Zone, right in this location right here. And also, they did confirm, HVO does admit, so does USGS, that this whole section, from basically from right about here to right here, is heading towards the sea, and has been since the 2018 eruptions. It is slowly but surely sliding to its demise. Who knows when that could happen, or in what way, shape, or form that would happen, but it's definitely something to keep an eye on for sure. And it's still continuing. USGS even admits it in its monthly updates for Kilauea. And you can just find that by going to the Kilauea alerts and reading the most recent ones. And also, and apparently USGS did put out a video about the water within Haole Mau, Mau Crater. And the link to it is right here. I will put a link to it in the description box below so you guys can easily get to it. I have not watched it yet, but I probably will watch it by the time I have this video uploaded to YouTube. But I will put that link in the description box below for you guys to check out. The water pond continues to grow, slowly rise, within Haole Mau, Mau Crater, Kilauea. Now, here is an animated GIF of the rise from August 7th, 2019 through September 25th, 2019. This is an animated GIF on their website at volcanoes.usgs.gov of the slow rise of the pond. Now, my computer's taking a little while to get these images up. Just to say, come on, buddy. There we go. Look at that pond grow, guys. Look at that thing. It's not really a pond anymore. It's starting to turn into a little lake. Look at that. Remember, it started as a teeny tiny guy on July 25th, 2019, when it was first spotted. And it continues to fill, continues, and continues to slowly expand, basically at a constant rate, guys. I mean, I don't think it's really even slowed much. I don't really think it's jumped much. I think it's just slowly doing its thing over a long period of time. So, also, on my website, under Hawaii, Hawaii blog, I am also going to post a link in the description box below to September 1st through October 9th spasmodic tremor weekends where I'm going to show this spasmodic tremor all 
spasmodic tremor that has occurred since September 1st through October 9th, which is a very, very low amount. I believe only four spasmodic tremor occurred, and most of them were extremely weak. So we've definitely seen a weakening of these events. I'm going to leave a link to this in the description box below. Remember, this is not done yet. This post that I have up is not done yet. So check back tomorrow morning if it is not completed. I'm going to try to get it up as soon as I can. So just check back again tomorrow morning if this is not up. But the most recent one occurred on October 4th. Let's just take a very fast look and swarm from two seismic stations around the Big Island of Hawaii of the October 4th spasmodic tremor event. And also, if you want to know what spasmodic tremor is and how it relates to volcanic activity on the Big Island of Hawaii, you can go to my Hawaii section right here and click Hawaii Spasmodic Tremor, or just go to the link in the description box below where I leave you a link for this page in particular, telling you what spasmodic tremor is, my observations, and how it may be related to magma recharge of Mauna Loa, Kilauea, and the Kilauea East Rift Zone. So here we have data obtained from TRAD and the HV Network on October 4, 2019. Now, on this day, there was only one spasmodic tremor event. It was all right. It was pretty strong, not compared to a lot of spasmodic tremor that occurs, but it was a good sized event right here. Last, and I'm gonna say, let's just say it started at 1834 and ended 1854. So let's say about 20 minutes or so. Just a rough estimate how long it lasted, about 20 minutes, which is pretty short compared to a lot of other spasmodic tremor events. Now, we did see this right here. Now, TRAD resides on the slopes of Mauna Loa, and sometimes spasmodic tremor can look like surface events. So if you're watching out for spasmodic tremor, just take data from HUAD, which resides many, many miles away from TRAD. Focus up the time. Here, let me go right here. Let me go to the seismogram right there. Let's see if I can zoom in just once on this, just to see if we can get a good arrival on the clipboard. Oh, whoopsie. There we go. Okay, so we got that on the clipboard right there. Let's go to HUAD <clears throat> and see if we can do this, shall we? And zoom all the way out. Click a one hertz high pass filter to draw out some of those higher frequencies a little bit. And let's see if we can connect this event to the event on TRAD, shall we? All right, now notice how the times are synchronized. And if you don't believe the times are synchronized, just select the top one and click right here, synchronize times with selected wave, and the times are synchronized. Notice that HUAD is far, far away from TRAD. So any spasmodic tremor event will definitely show on TRAD and HUAD. Remember, if it's a surface event, it will not show many, many miles away. And we do see the increases in energy do occur pretty much right where they should, should. Notice that? So we did see another spasmodic tremor event on October 4th. Very interesting event. But spasmodic tremor continues to decline while earthquake activity continues to increase. It's almost like the earthquakes in the mantle plume are starting to replace spasmodic tremor. I don't know, guys. Very strange activity, that's for sure. Here we are back at my website. We're going to take a very quick look at my monthly volcano update for September 2019, which is the volcanoes of interest this month are Long Valley Caldera and Mount Shasta. I'm going to leave a link to this in the description box below. So if you want to just quit out of the movie right now, because this is the last thing of the video, go ahead and do that now. And you can just go and check out this monthly update because I do leave a link to it below. And remember, with all my monthly updates, I do use the USGS earthquake map button. I do have one here for each and every location I use. So instead of just looking at an image, if you don't prefer that, you can actually go to the map itself and look at the reported earthquakes for any given location and time period, especially for the time period that I state. For Yellowstone Caldera for September 19, there were 72 reported earthquakes for Yellowstone, which is much lower than the past three months. And September was a very boring month for Yellowstone earthquake enthusiasts. No moderate or major swarming took place this month. Steamboat Geyser, which resides in Norris, continues to shatter the 2018 record since it broke the record on August 27, 2019. Steamboat erupted four times in September, basically once per week. As of the time of this writing, October 9, 2019, Steamboat has erupted 39 times in 2019, which is 71 times since it reactivated in 2018. Now, the largest earthquake within Yellowstone National Park for September was a 2.4 at 15.7 kilometers in depth on September 8, 2018 at 1959 UTC along the western border of Yellowstone National Park, right down here, just south 
of West Yellowstone, Montana. And plots here are of the magnitude 2.4. Moving on to Long Valley Caldera, if you guys are keeping track of seismic activity, you'll know September was a very intriguing month for Long Valley Caldera. Notice you see a concentration of seismicity right up here, and I do have a zoomed in image right here. And if you guys don't want the image, you can just go to the map and look at it yourself. So, September 2018 was a very active month for Long Valley Caldera. There were a shocking 1,115 reported earthquakes for the Long Valley Caldera area during this month. Not counting the unreported earthquakes because there were too many or they were too small to be located. So I'm going to say the actual count of earthquakes is probably up near 2,000 to 3,000. But the reported count is still off the charts for one month, guys. A large majority of the seismicity occurred as part of swarming near Mammoth Lakes, California, right here, which resides within the caldera itself. Swarming started on September 13th and struck on and above the roof of the magma chamber beneath the caldera. The swarm was also non-linear in formation and looks more like fluid flow rather than tectonic activity. Also, for a few months prior to September, seismicity was slowly growing for the caldera. For example, June 2019 saw around 340 earthquakes reported. July saw 405, August saw 643, and of course September saw 1,115. The largest events of the month were two magnitude 3.0 earthquakes. One struck at 5.3 kilometers in depth on the 25th as part of the ongoing swarming near Mammoth Lakes, California. The other one struck at 5.1 kilometers in depth on September 27th along the southern rim of the caldera. Both earthquakes were reportedly felt by multiple people. The plots right here are of the 3.0 on the 25th, which struck near Mammoth Lakes, California, as part of the rapid fire earthquake swarm on the 25th. Newberry Caldera in Oregon saw a total of three reported earthquake events for September 2019. Newberry remains within background levels and is usually very quiet. Low frequency earthquakes used to dominate seismicity for a few years at Newberry. However, as of the past five months or so, low frequency seismicity has not been reported or noticed by amateur seismologists. The largest earthquake reported was a 0.3 at 2.9 kilometers in depth on September 16th at 12 UTC, just under the eastern caldera lake called East Lake. Plots here are of this event. Now, Mount Rainier did see something strange during September. Nothing too crazy, but something just weird. Now, during tw September 2019, Mount Rainier saw 27 reported earthquakes. This is higher than last month's total of 21 earthquakes. Included within the 27 reported events, there was a strange magnitude negative 0.0, .0 other event, which will be mentioned in just a second. Most of the seismicity this month occurred within the volcano itself. The largest event was a 1.6 and negative 2.7 kilometers in depth. Very shallow, but still within the edifice of the volcano. It struck on September 7, 2019 at 1049 UTC. Plots right here are of this earthquake. Now, on September 26, 2019 at 1910 UTC, there was a very strange magnitude negative 0.0, .0 quote unquote, other event. And that's what USGS labeled it as. They didn't label it as a rock slide or a landslide or anything like that. They labeled it as an other event at negative 2.3 kilometers in depth under the southeast slopes of the volcano. Now, it does not appear to be a glacier earthquake or avalanche. However, it is a very strange event nonetheless. Was this truly seismic or was this surface activity? If this were a surface event, I doubt USGS would have labeled it as negative 0.0, .0 other event, especially when they're very used to surface events happening in Mount Rainier. The seismogram plots right here are from three select stations around Mount Rainier. Station RCS was the closest station to this event. Station OBSR is further to the northwest, and Station Rush is even further west, many miles away from the event that occurred. So it is interesting this event traveled so far in the way that it did if this were a surface event. Very strange, guys. Doesn't look like an earthquake. Maybe some type of tremor event. Does not look like a landslide. I don't know. It definitely is a quote-unquote other event. It's just unexplainable. It's very odd. Mount St. Helens. First off, I visited Mount St. Helens on August 13th and September 12th of 2019. Both times I noticed the dome was steaming, although it was it was steaming earlier in August when I first visited. Uh-oh, that's a typo. I meant to say even though it was not steaming 
earlier in August. I'll fix that typo by the time I get the video up. But yeah, it's supposed to say even though it was not steaming earlier in August when I first visited it. Click here to see the footage of St. Helens steaming on August 13th. However, click here to see it steam even more on September 12th. Mount St. Helens experienced 25 reported earthquakes for September 2019. Most occurred directly under the summit. The largest event was an explosion to the northwest, but that was likely a logging blast of some sort. For the largest earthquake this month, it was reportedly in 1.0 at negative 1.1 kilometers in depth, very shallow, right under the summit. It struck on September 17th at 6.02 UTC, and here are the plots of the event. Mount Hood Mount Hood in Northern Oregon experienced 13 reported earthquake events, which is three higher than last month's total. Remember, July itself saw a total of 155 earthquakes reported within only a few days. It was a very energetic and rapid-fire swarm, so please click there to visit my blog post about that crazy earthquake swarm. Most of the earthquakes in September occurred under the southern base of the volcano, with a few striking under the volcano itself. The largest event of September was a 1.6 at 6.8 kilometers in depth on September 5, 2019 at 635 UTC under the southern base of the volcano. And actually the 1.6 is this right here. Yeah, it's not this one. This looks stronger, but that's because it might be a little more shallow. Apparently it's going to be this one. So I don't know. Very interesting. Moving on to Mount Shasta. And as you guys know, if you've monitored it, Mount Shasta was very active in the beginning of September. September 2018 was an extremely intriguing month for Mount Shasta. Although Shasta typically only sees a few earthquakes reported per month, there were 47 reported for September 2019. Almost all of these events occurred within a very short time frame of one day and occurred in a concentrated patch under the southeast base of the volcano. Although Mount Shasta has seen swarms before, and this swarm was small compared to swarms at other volcanoes, this was likely the largest earthquake swarm to strike Mount Shasta in decades. And if you wish to see the blog post about that swarm and the swarms and the one swarm many years prior to that one, just click that button right there. Now the largest reported earthquake for September was at 2.7 at 5.6 kilometers in depth on September 2nd at 1734 UTC. It struck under the southeast section of Mount Shasta and struck as part of the September 2nd through 3rd 2019 earthquake swarm. 19 people reported feeling the 2.7, which is impressive for an earthquake of that size and depth. Plots right here are of that event. Lassen Volcanic Center, LVC. Lassen Volcanic Center, also known as LVC, experienced 10 reported earthquakes for September 2019. That's pretty low compared to the last two months of seismicity. The largest event this month was magnitude 1.4 at 5.7 kilometers in depth on September 4th at 10.38 UTC. It struck just south-southwest of Lassen Peak itself. Plots below are of this event. Well, guys, that's basically it for right now. Let's see if anything crazy or I've been recording. Nothing too crazy. Nothing too crazy here. So, guys, except a 4.9 in Chile, but Chile gets hit by a lot of earthquakes, so it's not too crazy. That's it for right now. Let me know what you think. Check the links below. And remember, I'll be back next week. I can pretty much only make a blog post and a video once per week, so... So that's pretty much it. But remember, just because I didn't make a video doesn't mean I don't have something on my website. So just bookmark my website. Make sure you got that on there. Check back on the many different pages I have on there every now and then. And especially check the Steamboat Geyser page once per week or so. So Steamboat should be erupting in the next six days. I might not be able to do a video by that time, but we'll see when it happens. See you later, guys.